Good afternoon. As you're gathering, I'm going to just begin. Uh, I have some announcements and some introductions, so I will just get, get us started. And welcome to the International Catacomb Society, first of our two panels for Show Hat Scholars, each of them featuring three of our wonderful scholars. Um, these two panels, along with the panel, uh, the, the lecture on, in February by Nicola Denzi Lewis, and one that will be upcoming in June by Norbert Zimmerman, are all part of the Catacomb Society's 40th anniversary celebration, which was delayed by COVID, but it, so we are a little bit after the 40 years, we're actually would have been 40 years in 2019. Um, I'm Robin Jensen. I'm at the University of Notre Dame, and I'm joined here by my vice president. I'm the president of the society, and I'm joined here by, by Arthur Urbano, who is the vice president, and he's my co-host for this event. Um, and we just thank you, too, for joining us, all of you. Before we get started, I just wanted to say a little bit about the Showhead Fellowship. Um, this began with a gift from our founder, Estelle Showhead Bretman, um, once I do that, I'm going to introduce the speakers. So let me just uh, tell you that that will be coming in a moment. Um, the Show Has Scholars Program uh, funds, I'm reading now from our website, funds research on the ancient Mediterranean from the Hellenistic era to the early Middle Ages. Winners of this competitive fellowship do their research in the fields of archaeology, art history, classical studies, history, comparative religions, or any related subject. Annually, I can tell you our grants range from $5,000 to $30,000. Um, and so please uh, see our website. Um, and I believe um, it's already up in the chat or the link to our website. You can see that website, uh, catacombsociety.org, for more information on applying for these fellowships or anything else about the, the society and membership. And also you will see there a list of past and present winners of this fellowship, these scholars, and also a short descriptions of their projects. So that's it. I want to welcome these three um, wonderful Showhead scholars for today. Um, let me introduce them all and then tell you that um, at the end, we will take questions when they're all finished. And so if you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And once all of the speakers are finished, we'll then take questions um, from the chat. So that will sort of simplify and I hope make things uh, easy and, and uh, access easy. So I'm going to introduce Nate uh, DeRosier. First, um, Nate is an Associate Professor of Biblical Studies and the Chair of the Religious Studies Department at Stonehill College. Much of his writing and research focuses on issues of conflict and competition in the ancient world, which has led to his creation of the section Religious Competition, Interdisciplinary Approaches for the, um, the Society of Biblical Literature. He has produced two recent volumes, Religious Competition in the Third Century CE. He's the editor of these. Jews, Christians, and the Greco-Roman world, and also edited religious competition in the Greco-Roman world. And his PhD is from Brown University, and his title today is Aphrodisias, City of the Gods. After Nate, we have Sarah Madol Lewis, who is the Associate Professor of Art History at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Sarah's research focuses on the funerary art of ancient Roman um, in context and with specialization in Eastern Mediterranean and writing women's histories. Her most recent essay, Female Experience at the Tomb, Ritual Commemoration and Roman Sarcophagus Imagery, and she's currently working on a book project that examines the social context of funerary art in the Roman East, including the patronage of women. And her PhD comes from NYU's Institute for Fine Arts. Sarah's title today is The New Perspectives on Mythological Sarcophagy in, the, in Subterranean Rome. And finally, our third speaker, Dan Daniel Yolucci, is the associate professor also at Stonehill College. His work focuses on uh, the interaction between early Christian groups and traditional Mediterranean religions. His book, The Christian Rejection of Animal Sacrifice, examines why Christians came to reject that practice. He currently is focusing on the ways in which competitive practices among religious experts shaped early Christian rituals. His latest book analyzes the Christian discourse on spiritual sacrifice in relationship to monetary giving by Roman elites. He also earned his PhD from Brown University. So welcome to all of you. Um, we're very glad you've joined us. 
And again, each presentation will last about 20 minutes. When all three are finished, we will take questions from the chat. So thank you, all of, your, all of our audience for keeping yourselves on mute in the meantime. Um, and I will wrap us up with an announcement of the upcoming events again. So thanks. And let me turn this over now to Nate. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to get my screen share up here. So everybody can see that OK. That look all right. That's good. So uh, not a great way to start, but I'm going to have to start by disagreeing with my host, Robin, um, because I did change the title of this, of course. So um, <laughs> so let me give you a, a little bit of background to this. Um, I will get into the aphrodisiac stuff at the very end. Um, but what I thought I would start with was uh, essentially, you know, all of the good things that uh, show it has been able to do for me. So thank you all for being here. I want to thank ICS for asking me. Um, and especially for its support. Um, as you know, Dan and I can both tell you, coming from a smaller, you know, teaching center college, um, the kinds of things that uh, ICS can do for us goes a, an awfully long way. So uh, the starting point is going to be on Roman solar cults here. And so let me start with a little bit of a formal read from parts of a couple of papers, and then this will get a little bit more informal as I go. Um, so during the third and fourth centuries, the Roman Empire saw a proliferation of solar cults as the sun became a favored patron of many emperors. Perhaps most no noteworthy uh, as a turning point was Aurelian's well-documented focus on Sol and his re reinvigoration of his state cult, which pre proved even more significant decades later under Constantine. So this is from a 2019 paper. Here's, here's our god soul here. Traditional scholarship often has dismissed these Roman solar, solar cults as marginal and disorganized with Aurelian's own religious program typically understood as a foreign importation grafted onto traditional Roman rites. My work is aiming to reconsider this um, by arguing that there is actually traditional Roman appeal to uh, Aurelian's maneuvers and the ways that the emperor manipulated various spaces in an effort to restore the city and empire. So I reevaluated some literary, numismatic, and archaeological remains. You can see quite a bit of numismatic stuff in a minute um, to try to show that his devotion to soul was only the final act in an effort to reclaim control and in some cases redefine space in Rome. Um, and I argue that his religious program was actually a carefully crafted renewal of Romanness. Okay, so to go a little bit more just into the background of this and why it got me interested, a big part of this is because typically scholars see Roman solar cults very negatively, um, that they represent this sort of decaying Roman, Roman religious system, and there's this inundation of lesser cults from foreign places, especially in the East. Um, and a lot of this seems to just follow uh, philologist George Wasowa, um, who's, who stated, uh, quote, Rome did not have natural gods, and that soul is the Greek Helios at origin. Um, a closer look at this makes this largely untenable, of course. There is ample evidence for Republican and early imperial Roman soul cults, which are described as originating among the most ancient and venerable Sacra Gentilicia. Um, in actuality, Sol never goes away um, throughout the imperial period, and no less than three of his temples remained open in Rome during this period, and there are inscriptions to him that we can date across any century you choose to name from Rome. So um, to go a little bit you know, further into this, I suppose, um, we could, let me see, all right, just looking sort of at the forum here, this will make sense in a second. Um, using this as a starting point, um, I'll, oops, sorry about that. So what I wanted to sort of talk about here is that Sol was usually described as a restorer. Um, and so if you're talking about a turbulent era like the third and fourth centuries, um, it makes some sense to actually see Sol uh, be someone who becomes a patron, right? Um, understood as someone who oversees all space that he provides divine help um, to restore a terrestrial, a terrestrial empire that's under his domain. So returning to Aurelian specifically, um, we can see a few interesting things that actually happen. Um, you know, he is building temples, uh, specifically a big one that's on the other side of the forum from here. Um, but I wanted to sort of orient you to, to what I was discussing here at the very beginning. So right in the middle of your screen, you see the Capitoline Hill, you know, it's sort of where the flag is, you know, on top of that tower. And so there was um, one of the oldest temples um, or the oldest temple to Seoul was there, um, and it was open throughout the imperial period, and people were still making drawings of some of the remains up until a few centuries ago, in fact. 
Um, and this was all aligned in a very interesting way that a lot of folks have overlooked over time. So one thing to remember is on the far end of the forum, you had the Colossus of Nero, which was actually uh, made as a sun god soul. Um, it just had Nero's face on it. Now, when Nero dies, um, the Flavians actually change the face to actually be soul. Um, and then a bunch of interesting things happen in this particular area, which you know I think is relevant just to sort of get a sense of why this is at least more important overall. So just sort of methodologically, I was just curious about you know, what could we really try to know if we didn't just assume that none of this really existed? So if you look uh, again towards that tower across the forum, essentially where you see those blue vans just to the left of the backside of the Colosseum, that's where the Colossus originally stood. Um, and of course, right to the left of that or right in that spot also, you can sort of see at the far left of the screen, the Arch of Constantine. That's not insignificant, of course, because the Arch of Constantine also has some soul stuff going on, okay? Now, um, what's kind of interesting here, there's the arch itself, um, and we're sort of looking the wrong way, but you can kind of see the arch here. The uh, statue itself, the Colossus, was moved by Hadrian. It was moved north and west a little bit, um, but overall, this all sort of works out in a particular way, because the way that you would have understood this, if you, you know, don't mind my dramatics here, is, you know, you would have sort of seen this guy looking over the entirety of the forum, all the way up the Via Sacra. Um, it's not obviously exactly to scale, um, but this is sort of an interesting sort of concept overall about how important these, these uh, cults are, okay? So um, we have an axis that would have worked like this, right up into uh, the, the Colossus looking at the Temple of Sol and there would have been a temple built by Aurelian just behind it um, in the Campus Martius. Even after it was moved, um, the axis would have still sort of worked similarly. Um, the reason why it was moved in the first place was because Hadrian wanted to build his Temple of Venus in Roma. Um, but the idea here just behind this, just for the sort of you know imagery and the playing around with this is just to sort of suggest why do we overestimate why sun gods weren't important? It's sort of a strange idea, okay? So just getting back to Aurelian a little bit, um, a couple of things that are kind of interesting about this is people assume um, this began because he restored temples in Syria to Bel. Interesting thing is um, Bel wasn't a solar god in Syria. Um, it was never a solar god really in the Roman period, not strictly speaking. Um, and instead, the idea that he would restore a temple was just a normal imperial act. Um, the fact that he would then put some images of Bel inside of a soul temple when he built it, um, would have also been normal practice um, for people to uh, put in images of other gods, particularly those representing places that were conquered. So instead of seeing these as novel, we can imagine that these represent restoration. Um, and so also I'd note, you know, depicting emperors with radiant crowns, you know, these solar crowns, that goes back to the Julio-Claudians, and it's pretty much standard on coinage from the time of Septimius Severus on. Okay, so using that as our starting point. Oops, sorry about that. That was not that was not what was intended. There we go. Um, what we can go from here is to uh, the next piece, a published piece on Constantine's coins, and uh, I did something sort of similar with this. Um, the presumption is, of course, that the, the motifs are uh, all Christian on his coins. And if we go a little bit further, this is where the name of today's presentation actually comes from. Um, so I show that we probably want to see a pragmatic ruler, not someone who's trying to overemphasize um, sort of Christian motifs on his coins or anything else for that matter. Um, in fact, you know, with the minting of coins, what we're seeing is the way that elite members of society actually compete within the context of political power. So while Constantine himself may have had very particular religious, religious beliefs, recent history would have told him that um, both persecution and the promotion of novel gods usually has disastrous results. So Constantine does try to describe himself as mild and full of clemency, as opposed to his cruel and tyrannical opponents and predecessors. And he states that he wants to bring everyone together um, into a single sustaining habit. Notice how non-Christian that language is, right? I mean, you could read it that way, but it seems to be deliberately elusive. Um, he also claims that he wants to bring the empire back together. So when we actually look at his coins, we see a few interesting things. Again, here's the uh, arch again. Um, the inscription 
if we look at that just for what it's worth, you know, this is the type of language he always uses. He uses terms like divine, um, but it's pretty vague, you know, the way that he uses that. And this is this is sort of emblematic of what he does up until the last five or six years of his role. Okay, and so looking at the coins, the uh, important thing here is these portraits of soul, right, which is going to be sort of a continuation. Um, to sort of give a little background here, um, a lot of things are happening between 310 and 313, of course. He uh, defeats Maximian, um, he takes over in Rome, he has his image of the solar god, the sun god in Gaul, uh, whether it's Apollo or Sol or whoever else. Um, and from this on point onward, Sol becomes pretty standard on his coinage. In part, that's because many of the coins before this were actually minted for him um, by other members of the Tetrarchy who are putting some of their own images on there instead of the choices that Constantine might have made. Um, so in, instead, again, of seeing something unusual here, we can see that he's doing something that's continuity. His father used soul on his coins. Um, Aurelian used, used soul on his coins. And so this is pretty much a standard. By the time he comes into Rome, of course, he completes the Basilica of Maxentius. Um, and so, you know, at this point forward, we start to see a major proliferation of coins coming out of Rome that actually depict the solar god. Okay, so um, just to give a couple of examples of ones that are kind of entertaining for us to think about and why people consider these coins so controversial is when people look at an image like this on the reverse, you see these two winged figures in an altar holding a wreath and the uh, inscription, you know, joyous victory to the eternal prince. Uh, obviously, if you're looking to see Christianity on that, you will. Um, but um, those also could be victories. The wreath uh, that is a dedication of votives from the people of Rome over an altar is something we actually see as early as Augustus, as it turns out. So there's nothing too creative about that overall. You could read it either way. Does eternal prince refer to Constantine? Does it refer to Jesus? Does it refer to Saul? Any of those would have been appropriate. Um, altars are pretty common on his coins, um, but the altars he uses are pretty unique. And this is one of those other things. Um, that usually are read the wrong way, or I think in a more complicated way than they should be. These are Roman style altars, uh, specifically their military altars um, from Augustine, at least, as well as some other sources. But if you're keeping score, Augustine Epistle 185 says that traditional Christian altars are going to be wooden tables up until the sixth century is what we seem to have evidence for, not these kinds of stone altars or things like that. Um, and so already we see in other authors that these are understood to be abhorrent places of sin by Christians. Um, and so instead we need to imagine something else is going on here. What these altars really seem to be are more like the military altars we see in places like Maryport and Housesteads. And what's also interesting is many of them have the same types of inscriptions that we actually see on the coins. Um, so this just sort of goes along with the kinds of stated goals that Constantine claimed to have, okay? So I'm gonna throw one more coin at you that just sort of complicates matters a little bit, but I still think we can you know, see some, some fun uh, types of interpretations through this. Um, so this is the one that comes uh, at the defeat of Licinius, okay? And so this is the really most overtly Christian looking one, of course. We have an imperial standard with the Cairo at the top, which seems to be stabbing a snake at the bottom. How dramatic. Um, so, um, of course, people read this as the snake is Satan, um, and so on and so forth. Now, two things about this coin that I think are important. It is minted for exactly one year between 327 and 328. It is minted only in Constantinople when he moves the capital, um, and nowhere else does it seem to have been broadly, you know, spread or used. But, um, let's really assess this, right? We can easily see this, and maybe even a Christian viewer could see this, but there isn't necessarily any reason to imagine that a non-Christian viewer would read this as the defeat of Satan, um, the way that moderns try to interpret this. Um, the Cairo was the symbol that he was using as his imperial standard for years before this, um, and referring to your enemy as a snake that you have pierced is actually a fairly common motif on Roman coins. So that's sort of where I uh, went with this particular piece. Um, and so going a little bit forward, um, you know, where this also sort of took me and to also give you a, a sense of um, some other things beyond um, 
where I'm going with this work and some of the other work I was doing. And also this gets me a little bit more into the sort of catacomb stuff. Um, of course, after Constantine, solar motifs continue to evolve. They're in popular culture everywhere. And they become relatively consistent symbols on Christian mon monuments, cenotaphs, sarcophagi. They're in graffiti well after the su supposed Christianization of the Roman Empire. Um, in fact, solar theologies and iconography have such deep roots in the Mediterranean and among Christians that it became a frequent topic for early Christian authors of, this, uh, of the second century and beyond. So Clement of Alexandria, for example, seems to be doing this kind of thing where he's talking about the sun of righteousness and the sun rising. Um, so it seems like these two pieces go together. By the time we get to the fifth century, Leo the Great is complaining that Christians are actually worshiping the sun. Um, and I found this to be a very interesting thing to follow up on. Um, so instead, we could imagine that this is some survival, some reappropriation of iconography into the Christian era, because as mentioned before, um, the sun is a symbol of birth and renewal, and so it continues to do so. So instead of seeing this as, you know, just heresy or something like that, um, we see just sort of common cultural borrowing here that I think is uh, pretty interesting. So to go a little bit further, you know, there's the famous, you know, Helios, Christ, you know, Vatican. Um, this is one that is from the Capital Line, Capital Line Museum. We do find a handful of sarcophagi with our friend Helios on it during this period. Um, there's no evidence that this is Christian, but this is just something that does appear on sarcophagi. Um, but in the Vatican, of course, um, you know, Thank you, ICS, for the access. Um, you know, we do have um, little things like this, like, for example, apparently a sun up there um, and lots of these images that continue to appear um, in all kinds of places, great and small. So that's some of the stuff I'm continuing to work on. Um, one more quick thing. Um, ICS also helped me to uh, do this piece, Another Temple, Another Vessel, um, where I'm talking specifically about how um, we rely too heavily on Josephus for interpreting the iconography um, on the Arch of Titus. Um, and that there seems to have again been this sort of emphasis of renewal that we uh, might be overlooking if we overstate um, or we overemphasize what Josephus says, his more apologetic viewpoint, which is of course important for Judaism and Christianity. But for a Roman, um, we have to remember that the looting of the temple in Jerusalem and what's depicted here is what paid for the Colosseum. Um, and that was very important after Nero had basically bankrupted the empire by building the Domus Aurea. Okay, one last thing just to get back to the original piece of this, the way I was introduced. Um, this is an ongoing uh, bit of work, um, as I said to Robin. Um, a lot of what you actually just saw resulted because um, while I was doing this work, there was oh, a military coup in Turkey, and it made it a little difficult for me to complete all of my work there. Um, but there are a few things I want to point out, and I'll do it so quickly because I'm at about 17 minutes here. Um, so I just want to show you three things where I see some competition that's really fun. So if you are unfamiliar, Aphrodisius is over here in Turkey. Uh, there it is. Um, it is dedicated, of course, it's an important pilgrimage site for the goddess Aphrodite, um, has an ex incredibly old cult here. Um, it's a pretty well laid out city and the archaeology makes it very helpful. We're going to look at the theater quickly, what's called the um, Portico of Tiberius and the Temple of Aphrodite. There's the theater. Theater is amazing because of all of the inscriptional evidence that survives to us. And one thing that has made me interested about this is we see inscriptions from both Romans and Christians in this theater. Now, it's notoriously difficult to date these with any certainty, but, you know, I think that this all by itself is important just as a sort of locus for understanding how competitive space is used in a city like this. Aphrodisius is unique because we have evidence of very few violent interactions between Romans, Jews, and Christians. Um, unlike in other places, we have no early martyrdom stories. It's a cultural and educational system known for its uh, school of philosophy as well as for its sculpture school. And so as a result, some different kinds of things seem to be happening here. The fact that bishops and Christian benefactors would choose a theater of Dionysus as a place of Christian donorship actually demonstrates something about how this city is evolving. Um, and how they're sort of interacting with one another, okay? Portico of Tiberius is an interesting place. On one end, you have a bath complex, but you have this very long, unusual um, pool that is 175 meters long by 25 meters long, and people have struggled to figure out what this is. 
Recent archaeology has discovered that actually there were palm trees and a lot of non-native plants in here, and that this place had high walls that were built in late antiquity, separating it from the outside. And it seems that all the way well into late antiquity, this was actually being used as a space um, that was a sort of a bath gymnasium complex. And the irony of this is the Christian church is literally right next door. So this seems to have been an evidence that these two places were sort of existing side by side in the city. And lastly, just for what it's worth, we have, of course, the important temple of Aphrodite. And as I was just mentioning to Robin, this temple was, uh, you know, they put all kinds of Christian graffiti all over it, um, like so. Um, but this is a temple that is the latest temple I know of operating. It's operating well into the sixth century. Um, and when they do convert it into a church, finally, um, what they essentially do is turn it inside out and put a variety of different Christian inscriptions inside. Okay. Thank you, ICS. Thank you for your time and attention. That's my 20 minutes. Um, I would really like to thank everybody for your time and attention. And um, now I'm handing this off. Sarah, thank you. Awesome, great talk, Nate. Looking forward to the Q&A. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my, I think my talk's a little more formal because I'll be uh, reading my paper, but um, uh, so good, more, uh, good afternoon. I'd like to thank the International Catacombs Society for supporting my research and especially Robin Jensen, Arthur Urbano and everyone who worked on organizing this wonderful panel and all the other events for ICS's anniversary celebration. I was awarded the Shohet Scholarship in 2016 in order to pursue a topic that has received relatively little scholarly attention. The presence of what I called at the time mythological sarcophagi, but have since expanded to the less refined but more inclusive sarcophagi without overt Christian symbols found in the catacombs of Rome. An example of this broader category um, is the sarcophagus shown on the on-screen image from the mid 19th century, a generic chest with S-shaped wavy uh, kind of strigil pattern and a medallion at the center, which in extant examples carries either a portrait figure or inscription. While many of the fragments and even entire chests and lids found today inside of these fascinating underground graveyards came from above ground tombs during landslides, other evidence attests to the intentional installation of these unwieldy, mostly marble coffins inside the catacombs. As a social historian that has to date focused primarily on Roman sarcophagi and the study of archeological contexts, I was struck by the presence of sarcophagi in the catacombs. Difficult to transport in the best of circumstances, here fitted into narrow spaces, illuminated only by lamplight, sometimes placed in the more private cubiculi, but occasionally in the less valued common gallery areas. Scholars of Roman sarcophagi have not systematically addressed the catacombs as a resource, presumably due to the standard interpretation of all sarcophagi found in the catacombs as a Christian reuse, despite the mixed religious origins of the earliest phases of catacombs like Praetextatus, Priscilla, and Domitilla. At all three sites, the master narrative reads that wealthy Romans, read pagans, um, buried their dead in above ground mausolea while the underground network was given to and developed for a poor Christian community. The chief issues at stake for me are archeological context, which has often been disrupted by ecological and human intervention, the chronology of use, that is how do the relative dates of manufacture and installation align, and if a gap is present, the question of reuse and whether this practice indicates anything about the religious identity of the deceased. And for now, I can assure you that the phenomenon of reusing functional coffins carved from a prestigious material is a pervasive practice found throughout the later Roman world that has no connection with specific religious identities. Rather, scholars have derived a de facto religious identity from the catacomb itself catacomb context itself, and have then developed arguments about a Christian predilection for reusing myth mythological sarcophagi. And there's much more to say about this, but let's turn to our first example. 
We begin with an image of a sarcophagus that is nestled beneath an arcosolium in the second extension or gallery in the most ancient area of the catacomb of Praetextatus near the Via Pia Antica in Rome. Few scholars have studied this monument in person due to its restricted location inside of a catacomb closed to the public. Moreover, this design belongs to a common strigil motif that's been largely overlooked in scholarship, with the exception of Huskinson's 2015 monograph. Scholars have mostly remarked, again, sight unseen, on the unusual addition of portrait features to the central standing figure, which at the time of the production of the sarcophagus in the Severan period, which I would place in the 220s, depicted the god Dionysus. Unlike the numerous examples on Roman sarcophagi of other deities intentionally outfitted with portrait heads, no other Dionysian portrait figure survives. And moreover, the portrait here was likely added in the 240s and therefore reflects the secondary use of the chest. The inscription reads Dimitri in Latin letters. For Demeter, or of Demeter, for Demetrius, no clear solution exists, although other comparisons from this catacomb list single names in what appears to be a genitive. The current location of this sarcophagus seems to be fairly close to its initial installation, although this gallery suffered considerable structural damage from landslides and has been heavily restored, which you can see here in this brickwork, which was laid by, um, there's a, there's a family still active in Rome that the gentleman who will take you, who took me around the catacomb of Vivia, he did, he does it, his grandparents, his grandfather did it. I mean, it's a long lineage and he can tell you when this was made and how it was redone. But the point is, this is a completely reconstructed gallery. And uh, even the kind of reinstallation, modern installation of this piece, you can see there's this huge pillar that's been added. It's definitely not original. Um, so my questions are, uh, include, uh, but are not limited to, you know, who was intended for burial in this sarcophagus? Was it Demetrius? Is that his portrait? Where was this installed when it was made in the earlier third century and did it move for its reuse? Regardless of whether the installation dates to the Severan period or the 240s, at this time, the space around the sarcophagus here, uh, that is the galleries in cubiculi along the Spelunca Magna indicates a mixed religious patronage. So here's A5, this is the little uh, niche or arcosolium for our sarcophagus here. Here's the big stairs that you take to enter the catacomb. So this was a huge cistern that is converted in the early third century to uh, funerary use. So our sarcophagus is right at the entrance. I applied for a Shohet scholarship to start looking into these kinds of questions for the numerous sarcophagi lacking any overt Christian symbolism found in the catacombs of Rome. And while I learned many things during my research tenure, notably the evidence for the presence of and vestiges of many marble sarcophagi in these catacombs, these questions remain at the forefront of my research. For this diagram, I'll point out, so these, um, this is from uh, my publication on, on, on Praetic Status. These red arrows indicate locations of traditional or neutral or non-overtly Christian sarcophagi. But in this area here, the reuse is later. It does belong to a Christian family. But even this addition, you can see it's a different color. It dates to a much later period. The dark gray are all the original uh, third century uh, extensions. The insistence on a religious interpretation for all material culture found in the catacombs, and especially a Christian uniformity, has been convincingly challenged by John Bodell, Barbara Borg, Nicola Denzi Lewis, Eric Rebillard, and others, all of whom inspired my research. Particularly, the earliest phases of Rome's catacombs must reflect mixed burials organized by family groups rather than by religion. Therefore, the presence of sarcophagi without overt Christian imagery, particularly for sarcophagi installed before and up to the mid third century, must be isolated and analyzed within their own archeological rather than religious context. 
This is not a widely accepted view. And the alternative interpretation is that all sarcophagi with non-Christian or neutral imagery reflects a promotion of Christian classicism, an argument laid out most forcefully by Lucrezia Spera. While the cultivation of traditional learning certainly occurred at the highest levels of society, I suggest that we question the idea that a later third century member of the senatorial class would reuse a sarcophagus of medium quality and place it in the semi-public gallery in a subterranean catacomb. In fact, we have stronger evidence for upper classes preferring more austere types like the stridulated sarcophagus. I think the answer here must uh, reflect a case by case examination of the material within its archeological context. In the case of the Dionysian sarcophagus, no other material recorded in its gallery preserves Christian epigraphic formulae or iconography, although you'll find these monuments collected in the Icor series of Christian inscriptions, which reflects another major complication in the study of catacombs. But suffice it to say for the present that no evidence points toward a Christian reuse of this coffin unless you take the catacomb context itself as the sole evidence. What my research looked like on the ground was two summers, 2016 and 2017. First, a Shohet scholar, and uh, speaking of the ICS, here's Nicola Denzi Lewis and the head of Jessica De La Russo, uh, both uh, affiliated with the ICS. Uh, the second summer, I was a guest of the German Archaeological Institute um, during these two summers, I worked with members of the Pontificio Istituto Archeologia Cristiana to access various catacombs. I visited the sites of Vibia, Rondinini, Praetextatus twice, Domitila and Priscilla numerous times in public and private tours and for individual resource and a private tour of Peter and Marcellinus and other kind of public tours at Agnes, San Sebastiano, and at Decimum, which you see on the left, which I visited twice. I studied the impressive sarcophagus museums at the, oops, there. I studied uh, the impressive sarcophagus museums at the catacombs of Praetextatus, Priscilla, and Domitilla, none of which have ever been or consistently remained open to the public. In terms of access, Jessica De La Russo from the International Catacombs Society connected me with key people at PIAC, namely Barbara Matze and Lucrezia Sfera. I was also greatly assisted by Raffaella Giuliani, inspector of the catacombs, Norbert Zimmermann from the DAI, who took me through many areas of Domitilla with a topographical knowledge only he possesses. I photographed entire collections through repeated visits to museums with holdings from the catacombs, like the Gregoriano Profano galleries at the Vatican. I studied the object registers at the PIAC, the PIAC archives. While I discovered even more evidence of traditional Roman presence in the catacombs than I had ever hoped for, the evidence was equally more fractured and decontextualized. Furthermore, while physically accessing the material was a feasible task, the red tape of publication permissions, particularly for the photography I had done, has made me rethink the scope of my intended publication program. Through productive conversations with Nicola Denzi Lewis, John Bodell, Robin Jensen, and others, I was able to carve out a small piece of my research, which I published as a preliminary case study of my findings from the catacomb of Praetic Status, in a, in a volume dedicated to sculpture and context with the second article currently in process. I presented several papers on my research at the annual meetings of the College Art Association and the Society for Biblical Literature. And I organized a panel on the catacombs with ICS for the 2018 Archaeological Institute of America meeting that took place in Boston. I do think the careful study of sarcophagi without Christian symbolism or neutral sarcophagi will be helpful and would make a great dissertation topic for a graduate student. In terms of a more contextual study that uh, attempts to explore the funerary landscape and its socio-historical significance, the most productive future directions for me will be to work on the traditional Roman necropolis that once occupied the territories above the catacombs. And here's one example. 
Uh, these Roman necropolis were ultimately destroyed in order to make room for the Christian basilicas, for example, at Donatilla and Priscilla, where both uh, basilicas preserve extensive traces of the now destroyed necropolis with several sarcophagi still in situ. Um, and there's a huge debate if the sarcophagi in situ are Christian or are or, or traditional pagan uh, Romans. This is a purely archival study focusing on several individual cases, uh, focusing on sarcophagi within the ever broadening overlap between the Roman and Christian material worlds. In conclusion, under the aegis of the International Catacombs Society, I gained access to restricted sites and the sarcophagi housed within, expanding my mental topographical map of the tombs and sepulchers of second to fourth century Rome an invaluable, productive experience that continues to bear fruit. Thank you. And I will now pass uh, the mic over to um, Dan, Daniel Lucci. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to, uh, well, good afternoon, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to share a screen with you. And uh, should we be able to see just the slides now, not the presenter tools? Uh, well, first, thank you to uh, to Robin and Arthur and to everyone at the ICS for the opportunity to talk here today and uh, to share um, uh, what I was able to achieve with uh, the support they gave me. What I'll talk about today is part of a larger project on early Christian offerings and the development of Christian elite. I'll try to highlight here the role that catacombs research has made has, uh, has has the role that it's had in this project, uh, and of course, it's been it's been been the show had uh, support that's allowed this to happen. Essentially, the catacombs widened our view of early Christian practices, forcing us to rethink normative assumptions about early Christian offerings and how a specific set of Christian practices became dominant. The vast majority of our evidence for early Christianity is filtered through literate religious professionals. Consider, for example, someone like Augustine of Hippo. Augustine is a bishop. He runs a church and has official ecclesiastical authority, but he also produces famous theological writings. Augustine is an example of what will become a key Christian figure, the literate expert. He makes his living through his religious activities. The main thing to recognize about religious experts like Augustine is that they are in no way normal people. They are generally highly educated, literate in a world where very few were, almost exclusively male and wealthy. Their status was tied to their ecclesiastical position and their textual production. The bulk of our evidence for early Christianity comes from these men. And in a classic example of history being written by the winners, their story has often been accepted as the Christian story. Recently, a whole range of critical scholars have tried to break down this model and complicate our understanding of Christian origins. One key insight uh, to, to accomplish this is simply the realization that religious experts are not representative. The ideologically crafted narratives and theological debates that make up so much of our data for early Christianity really reflect the ideas of only a very small percentage of the ancient Christian population. And this is a sort of sobering reflection. Uh, just for some perspective, uh, this is this reality is even the case in a highly literate society such as ours. The average literacy rate in the United States, for example, is close to 90%. And access to text has never been easier, but he has a, a phone in their pocket that they can uh, get anything on. Nevertheless, polls consistently show what anyone who's ever taught a New Testament introductory class already knows. Your average American self-professing Christian has read practically none of the Bible, knows very little of its content, and knows practically nothing of official theological ideologies. Uh, just to give an example of this, so we'll talk about lots of examples of this, but uh, this is a 2010 Pew uh, Religious Knowledge Survey. A lot of data up here, but I'll just look at two points. Uh, only about half of the people surveyed knew that the four Gospels were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and only a little bit more than half knew that the Golden Rule was not one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, you can go to, you can mine this data and break it down by uh, religious affiliation, but what this shows is what we all know as teachers, that uh, knowledge of official religious doctrines is not normal uh, in any society. So case for the past, uh, how much more would this been the case in the ancient world where literacy rates were down in single digits and a, few, a full manuscript of the Bible would be the financial equivalent of something like a luxury yacht? Our extant texts are simply not representative of the ideas and practices of the majority. The full implications of this reality are only recently being incorporated into our, our large macro level models of Christian development. Uh, this project, my project, attempts to contribute to this change by revising our understanding of early Christian practices. How do we tell the story of early Christian offering practices? 
Prior to Christianity, of course, offering things to the gods was a ubiquitous practice in the ancient Mediterranean. There was a huge range of offerings. I'll just give a few points. Uh, this is uh, this is the great altar in Syracuse, uh, designed to to accommodate the the famous sacrifice of a hecatomb, a hundred bulls from Homer. It's it's hard to get the scale here, but the height of the altar is around five feet. Uh, on the high side of ancient offerings uh, were grand animal sacrifices, such as would have taken place here, with hundreds of animals slaughtered and their meat distributed in citywide and sometimes empire-wide festivals. Uh, smaller scale would be a this is a sort of normal normative uh, rural temple, also in in Sicily. I uh, see the temple is quite small and the altar is relatively small, but still fairly large. On the more humble side, a poor farmer might offer a pinch of barley or a few drops of wine at a household shrine. Uh, we have a lot of these preserved from Herculaneum in Pompeii. This one's from Herculaneum, pretty uh, elaborate. A simpler one would just be a hearth that would leave no archaeological evidence at all. Ancient Mediterraneans did not offer things to their gods because they thought that their gods ate dead animal parts or burned cakes. They made offerings for the same reason that reciprocity is a key practice in all of our lives right now. Reciprocity is about relationships, indexing, maintaining, and negotiating relationships. If I buy a gift for my boss or a drink for a friend, I'm not suggesting that they need it or that they cannot get their own, nor am I trying to crassly bribe them. It's about our relationship. Reciprocity through offerings large and small was a basic practice of ancient Mediterranean religion, which tied people to each other and to their gods. Evolutionary biologists have shown that reciprocal offering practices as a, mean to a means to negotiate relationships is in fact a transhuman phenomenon. Crows actually have a fairly complex social network maintained through uh, complex acts of giving. Primates have even more complicated practices. Of course, human practices are far more complex than any animal offerings because the human brain is uh, in turn far more complex, but we cannot ignore the reality that many of the elements of human behavior that we think of as cultural are in fact linked to the evolutionary history of our species. I would say that uh, reciprocal offerings are, are one of those. Returning to Christianity, ancient Christianity, if acts of reciprocity are the main way that people in the ancient Mediterranean interacted with their gods, how did Christianity develop into a tradition that rejected these practices? This is a seemingly radical historical change that would demand explanation. For much of the last 2000 years, the usual explanation has been the explanation that Christian experts themselves created. It can be found in things like the letter to the Hebrews, uh, the writings of Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Irenaeus, Cyprian, and, and many others. In general, it goes like this. So just a quick summary, uh, the general model. Uh, Christians rejected, the model assumes that Christians rejected sacrifice right from the very beginning. And Jesus is usually seen as the origin point here. Uh, it assumes that Christians recognize that God did not want material offerings. He wanted metaphysical things like obedience, faith, proper doctrine. Christians therefore refused to participate in sacrifice right from the start. Uh, and the Christian martyrdom literature is a good example of uh, literary setups where Christian refusal to perform sacrifice becomes a key piece of Christian identity formation. This was of course hard at first, but as Christianity grew to dominance, its rejection of sacrifice became more widespread. There were challenges along the way. There, were, uh, there was enormous, enormous inertia that needed to be overcome. Some heretical Christian groups still practiced sacrifice. Uh, the heresiologist Epiphanius famously mentions a group called the Coloridians who offered cakes to Mary. Pagan influences sometimes even infected Orthodox Christian practices. Augustine says that his own mother offered cakes at martyr shrines before a local bishop set her straight. Eventually, the Christian rejection of sacrifice succeeded, ushering in a period of true spiritual worship, which in which the vulgarities of bloody sacrifice were superseded. This is a common narrative. It's a simple and effective story of Christian identity. It is also completely demonstrably untrue, as is, uh, I'm not the first person to say that, it's uh, becoming more, more uh, common. A few things to note about this story. First, it assumes that physical offerings were never part of Christianity. They were always a foreign polluting influence from the outside, brought in by recalcitrant pagans or evil heretics, or perhaps misguided Judaizing factions. The second thing to reiterate is that this supposedly historical model does not derive from historians at all. It's the creation of Christian theologians. It's already present in Christian texts in the second century. The fact that this model originates with Christian apologists does not necessarily mean it's wrong, but it certainly means that we should question it. How might we tell the story of Christian offerings a different way? By considering broader evidence, we can catch a glimpse of those early Christian practices 
that the traditional narrative intentionally hides. It turns out that evidence to challenge the traditional model is actually present in many early Christian texts themselves. Archaeological evidence is more challenging, but can also prove more convincing. I'm fortunate uh, to build on the excellent work of previous scholars, many of whom have been Shohet recipients and other members of the International Catacomb Society, uh, including Robin Jensen's work on funerary practices and Nicola Denzi Lewis's work on ecclesiastical remodeling of the catacombs. What I'll try to provide here is an alternate story of Christian offerings. So how might we tell the story uh, in a different way looking at broader evidence? First, the idea that Christians rejected offerings from the very start is simply not tenable given the early Christian evidence. The letters of Paul in the New Testament Gospels show no rejection of physical offerings to Yahweh. Rather, the Christian anti-sacrificial discourse begins to develop only in the late first century. Uh, once established, however, it becomes quite strong. Passionate rejections of sacrifice are a common theme in Christian texts in the second and third centuries and onward. However, these texts need to be balanced with a growing body of evidence showing that Christians really did make offerings to martyrs, saints, and the Christian dead throughout antiquity. This can seem jarring. Uh, the idea of Christians making physical offerings, we could, could and probably should call them sacrifices, seems antithetical to Christian ideology. Pagans make sacrifices, Christians do not. But this is exactly the normative model that we need to challenge. Early Christian experts, men like Tertullian, Augustine, and John Chrysostom, absolutely claimed that such offerings were incompatible with true Christianity. But a significant portion of the ancient Christian population simply did not agree. They didn't care what these experts said. Again, there's nothing new or odd here. This is a normal aspect of religious groups, as has been shown by the work of Harvey Whitehouse, Stanley Stowers, and others. A significant percentage of self, for example, a significant percentage of self-professing Christians today do and believe things that would be deemed heretical by their own clergy. The social realities here, then, they're, they're, they're complicated. Uh, why are religious experts given authority in some aspects of life, but uh, unashamedly ignored in other aspects of life? Uh, we need a model that would account for, for that. The evidence from catacombs can help illustrate, uh, illustrate this. Uh, because they often preserve evidence of Christians making physical offerings. The history of catacomb archaeology, uh, laid out very well by Nicola Denzi Lewis in the last ICS uh, presentation, uh, shows some of the complications of trying to do this work. Uh, and Sarah mentioned it as well. The first explorers and documenters of the catacombs were operating with a set of unanalyzed assumptions about what constituted Christian evidence uh, and material culture versus non Christian evidence and material culture. Things which did not fit their model of what Christians were supposed to be doing were likely classed as simply pagan. Nevertheless, key pieces of data from the catacombs remain. Catacomb art frequently depicts dining scenes. Uh, this is Robin Jensen's work. In Christian context, contexts, these have often been interpreted as depictions of the Last Supper, but they look exactly like non-Christian refrigeria scenes. Uh, these were offering meals where the living would eat and small portions of the meal would be offered to the deceased who were imagined to be present at the repast. Here's another uh, slide from the Pio Cristiano collection. More telling, catacombs sometimes preserve physical infrastructure specifically designed to accommodate offerings. Uh, what we see here is a burial from the San Giovanni catacomb in Syracuse. The slab covering the burial contains openings to which are attached copper pipes leading directly into the burial chamber. This is in an undeniably Christian context. These are offerings. The Christians making them are carrying on acts of reciprocity with the honored dead who are imagined to have power and influence in the human world. Uh, and the San Giovanni Catacomb uh, presume, uh, preserves some other examples of this. Here's another piece. Uh, and these, these offering um, openings, they look exactly like the kind of offering openings we see in Roman context. So two chunks from, uh, from presumably Roman burials, uh, but this is exactly a time period where you can't often tell the difference between a Roman burial and a Christian burial because the iconography is not distinct. This evidence, uh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, these pieces might be slight, but when put together with textual evidence, the catacombs help support a growing scholarly consensus. And this has been put forth uh, most strongly, I think by Ramsey McMillan in his book, The Second Church. Uh, in short, the church was not the primary sacred site for many early Christians. Rather, tombs and shrines were the places where Christianity happened, and physical offerings were often central practices at these, at these sites. This evidence has often been brushed aside as uh, 
evidence of incomplete Christianization or the carryover of pagan practices or the work of heretics. But those would, of course, be Christian confessional claims, not, uh, not historical analysis. The model or our model for the development of Christian offerings needs to be more complicated. Just a little breakdown here. We need a model that includes both of these two realms of practices and discourse that uh, we've, we've just been discussing. To, to oversimplify this a lot, but to, to present it as a dichotomy, it's not a dichotomy, but to present it as a simple dichotomy. Uh, on the one side, you have people like Augustine and John Chrysostom. They argue vociferously that real Christians don't make physical offerings. On the other side, we have the Christians who built the San Giovanni Catacombs. They simply don't care what ecclesiastical experts said. As far as they were concerned, they were Christians and their practices were entirely Christian and entirely uh, religiously appropriate. Our model for early Christianity needs to encompass these two contradictory positions or forms of practice. Clearly the form of Christianity that came to dominate, dominate in the fourth century uh, rejected physical offerings. But how did this happen? So I see this is sort of the, the central question of, of the current project. It was not a foregone conclusion that Christianity would develop into a religious tradition dominated by the ideologies and practices of literate experts. Such was never the case for Greek and Roman religion, nor of Judaism, at least before the rabbinic period, and it's not the case in many contemporary religious traditions today. How did early Christian experts, bishops and text producers, men like Augustine, ever gain the social power necessary to dominate Christian discourse and practice? even to the extent of abolishing or at least significantly hindering the practices that they deemed unchristian practices like physical offerings. Christianity in the second and third century was a mix of ecclesiastical experts and the churches they ran and an array of local shrines, tombs, and sanctuaries where physical offerings were made. Why didn't it stay that way? To answer this, I suggest we follow the money. Christian experts developed a strongly anti-sacrificial ideology. They claimed that the Christian God did not want animals or cakes or drops of wine. He wanted spiritual worship. This claim that true Christians offer pure spiritual worship, not crass material offerings, becomes a central tenet of ecclesiastical ideology, the ideology associated with churches and the practices taking place within the churches. This ideology, however, masks a critical financial reality. A significant and steady stream of capital was flowing into the churches of the fourth century. Uh, changing the reality of, of early Christianity. Just to give an example of this, uh, this is a donor list from uh, a fourth or fifth century basilica in Florence. It's underneath the present Romo. Uh, this is something that will look familiar to anyone, uh, anyone who works in a modern day college. So, so this is a, a list of people who gave money to the church and it records their names and the amount of feet of floor, mosaic floor that they paid for. So the, the fourth line here is probably the easiest one to read. It says, uh, Marcellus, Tech P for Perez, uh, CC 200. So Marcellus uh, paid for 200 uh, presumably square feet of mosaic. Um, you see down here another name, probably Optatus. Uh, Optatus only paid for 100 square feet. Uh, these look exactly like the donor, the donor inscriptions that cover any, any modern college campus. This money funded the expansion of churches and the growing professional class that ran these churches. So it's not a matter of material offerings on one side and pure spiritual offerings on the other. It's agricultural offerings on one side and financial offerings on the other side. So we can sort of uh, refine the question that we're asking here. Uh, how did a form of Christianity, Christianity that rejected agricultural offerings but approved of financial offerings come to dominate? This influx of financial capital is what gave ecclesiastical experts the ability to curtail offering practices that conflicted with their own ideologies and presented a challenge to their hegemony. The catacombs provide evidence for this process. Pope Damasus famously attempts to co-opt the popularity of particular tombs by lavishly redecorating them, presenting himself as the patron and proper successor of the saints. Churches were often built directly over and around popular saint and martyr shrines, allowing ecclesiastical experts to control the activities at these sites. One literally could not get to the tomb of the martyr or saint anymore, except through the world of the ecclesiastical elite. Uh, the discourse on pure spiritual worship serves to mask this influx of wealth and the shift in social power that it created. For the sake of time, I won't drag us through the rest of, of the project. Uh, what it attempts to do is look at the practices of uh, the giving practices of Roman elites 
and why they might have decided to redirect their charitable giving from supporting things like animal sacrifices and traditional Greco-Roman uh, cults to supporting churches. The short answer to this, I believe, is that the discourses and practices of Christian religious experts were tailored to the intellectual interests and pretensions of wealthy Roman elite of the fourth and fifth centuries. Backing Christian, Christianity, but not just Christianity, backing church-based Christianity, became a way for Roman elites to signal just the kind of identity and status culture they were interested in. Um, and here you see a scene from the Hypogeum of the Aurelii. Uh, so this is a non-Christian site, but these are a group of Roman freedmen uh, depicting themselves in the way they wanted to be depicted. They're, they're dressed as philosophers. Uh, this the sort of core of the argument here is that Christianity becomes a way for Roman elite to, to show that an identity that they're interested in. I hope this quick discussion uh, shows that the catacombs force us to rethink the story of ancient Mediterranean offerings. The major change that Christianity, that Christianity brings about is not a change from material offerings to pure spiritual offerings. It's a change from mostly, mostly agricultural offerings to mostly financial offerings. And I'll, I'll just lead with, uh, or finish with, uh, a list of some of the publications that uh, the show had support has allowed me to uh, produce. So thank you so much and uh, turn it back over to Robert. Thank you so much. This has been a really rich uh, session. And now I'm hoping we see some questions show up in our chat. Um, I don't see any right now, but I'm going to just go ahead and start with one while people maybe be able to frame their, their questions um, and go ahead and put them in chat. And uh, Arthur, you can pick up any that you come across next. But I wanted to address this one to Sarah. Um, just as a, just as a, just a, I think maybe you said this and I might've missed it. So I'm just maybe clarification, but the um, Dionysian sarcophagus you started with, um, you said it was, it was reused, but the, the, the portrait head was added later. Is it possible that that portrait head was original and that we just have one of those funny Roman sarcophagi where the, they get a funny you know, Roman head on the top of a beautiful god? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, the portrait dates to the 240s. Ah, okay. And the sarcophagus, so the Dionysian kind of production chronology is fairly tight. This really looks like a sarcophagus from the 220s. But the bearded fellow is from the 240s. Okay, sure. we so often see those wonderful instances of, you know, you, you see, I think my favorite example, and John Bodell may remember this, was, um, um, oh, who, the emperor, um, I'm sorry, Titus's father. <laughs> <laughs> on a beautiful Vespasian. yeah, Vespasian's portrait on the top of a beautiful, you know, very buff guy, you know, and going well, a naked guy, buff, and it was quite funny. So sometimes you see that too. So I was wondering if that was what we saw, but <laughs> that's why it's it, the party line that I don't feel the need to shake up is that while other gods were subjected to that kind of like, you know, self um, alignment in funerary monuments, somehow Dionysus was off limits. Oh. And this is the only one. And then people go, well, it was like a Christian reuse. So, and that doesn't actually answer the question of what's going on. Great, that's, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Seeing it. I, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, um, but uh, I, I also will encourage anyone to, to put questions in, but, but if I could jump in too in the meantime. Um, uh, and, and this is really a question for, for all, all three panelists, and it, it sort of gets beyond your actual projects and, and into kind of the, the weeds of, of doing your projects and, 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 and researching. And this is something that Sarah brought up in her presentation about sort of red tape and bureaucracy. But I was just wondering, you know, could each of you maybe just say something about your own experiences, you know, in Italy, in Turkey? I know, Nate, you already mentioned you got, you know, there was a coup going on. So, you know, that that complicates things. COVID has complicated things, um, you know, recently for researchers. Um, but, I, but I'm wondering, you know, in terms of navigating sites, um, getting permissions, that sort of thing. What, what were your experiences like? Because I think, you know, when, when um, uh, scholars, and I had this experience myself, um, you know, when, when you're undertaking this kind of research for the, for the first time, 
you know, that it's kind of like, whoa, I, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this. Right. I mean, that was a position I was in and had to do a lot of learning uh, to figure out how to navigate things in, in Italy and Rome specifically. But I was just wondering if each of you could share a little bit about your experience um, with that. I'll be happy to go first if that's okay, um, because there are a few things um, beyond what I mentioned. So, um, you know, the, the catacombs and things in the Vatican in general, the art in the Vatican, museum things. Um, Arthur, you were actually the person that got me on the, on the right path initially. Um, and, you know, from there, I actually found it relatively easy to, once you had contacts with the people that were doing the Christian art in the Vatican to come and go. And so I did, you know, a handful of times. Um, after that, um, I participated in the Comcar seminar. Uh, Lily Vuong was in that too, but she's already jumped out. Um, and Nicola was part of that. Um, so, you know, Nicola was able to get us uh, access to a, a variety of different catacombs and a Sola Sacra and other places like that, where I found some interesting um, other pieces. Um, and in terms of Turkey, um, I sort of got, I got lucky there um, that it was really through Alexander Sokolacek, who's, you know, really from the University of Vienna, but he's kind of all over the place. Um, and he was my go-to person for a lot of things. Um, um, you know, this is going way back with, with ICS, but, you know, uh, Annavise Vandenhoek got me connected to Bert Smith and other people like that very early on. Um, and so that made it relatively straightforward. The, the, the only difficulty I ran into, as I said, was once there was a military coup and it was pretty clear that I it was interesting the the large parking lot that is at aphrodisius is apparently where they were parking armor um so that wasn't exactly a great place to be doing my work at the time um but um other than that um honestly it ics was incredibly helpful just because it gave me access to so many experts and so many other um opportunities i would have never never otherwise been able to just find on my own I guess if we go in order of speaker, I'll go next. Um, you know, it, in terms of access, it's like it was a little bit of, you know, like De Jessica Della Russo connecting me with um, Lucrezia Spera, and then a little bit of, you know, Nicola was my undergraduate advisor, so I've known her for, and she happened to be in Rome that summer, and Dan was in Rome. And so, you know, and then it's a lot of who you know, and if you meet one person and then they introduce you to someone else and suddenly I'm with Barbara Borg going to some, a tomb that she had special permission for and she kind of hosted an outing that summer. And those sort of fortuitous connections and relationships that I know is part of like the ICS's mission and the Shohet Scholar, the mission is connecting you know, on the ground, you can do that. And then you meet the museum person you need to write to and you suddenly have their email that's not on the website, but you met them and then you email them and they say, oh, I'm in a different position, but here's who you should email. And you really have to be in Rome to make those, if you're working in Rome, you need to be where you are doing your research to make those connections. And certainly in Italy, I find that those relationships are really fostered in person and it takes time and multiple trips and working on my Italian, which everyone, you know, thought was like very, <laughs> you know, charming uh, in my attempts, but uh, that it took just kind of repeated trying and showing up and it a little bit was fortuitous. And there's still things that I remember, you know, speaking to a person at PIAC and they're going, no, I don't think we're gonna let you in there, but we're gonna let you in here. I was like, okay, great, thank you. You know, and photography here, but not there. Okay. Uh, so just like patience and persistence. I think I had a, a very similar experience to, to Nate and Sarah, um, that when you first start doing this, the learning curve is enormously high and it's sort of uh, intimidating. You don't really know what, how to even begin to do these things. You, you really need an expert to lead you through the process. And Arthur was my expert uh, and, it, the reason any of it happened was because he showed me how to make it happen. And uh, 
that piece of, of what ICS tries to do is hugely important. Uh, once, once you, you know, minor, minor frustrations along the way, but once you knew the right people and you had relationships with people and you saw the process, I was shocked at the, the opportunities I had to go places I never thought were going to be possible and uh, do things that uh, do research that didn't seem uh, open to somebody who uh, wasn't far higher up the ladder of uh, internal people than I was. So yeah, it was really impressive. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and, and jump in. I want to take Lois's question. I also want to just apologize for the not recognizing the change of the titles that you all had, but I think that's also sort of interesting in terms of the work. Often we know that once we start a project, even under one that's a grant, sometimes those projects will, will, will change and evolve in, in interesting and good ways. So it's, you know, we never hold like, just like a dissertation proposal, we never hold somebody to this, you know, because they're going to, the point is the learning and the, and the growing and um, that those always evolve. Um, Lois did, uh, Lois Frog, uh, hello, Lois. Um, you have a question here that you posed uh, to Dan in terms of how do you interpret the financial donations as financial sacrifices? And she kind of gives a contemporary parallel that we don't always think of financial donations as sacrifices to universities or schools. So um, but you want to say more about that? Thank you so much. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I guess that's the, to me, that's the brilliance of uh, the, the early Christian elite guys like Augustine, that they were able to transmorph, transmogrify this normal giving practices of Roman elites and convince the Roman elites that giving to Christian churches was the thing that they wanted to do and that that would present them as the kind of people that they wanted to be. Um, and often it is, it's by not using the, the terminology of sacrifice. So uh, the way in which church-based Christianity reuses the term, the, the terminology of sacrifice is to apply it to, to Christ and to say that uh, Jesus is the sacrifice that replaces all of this sort of pointless, stupid, gross animal sacrifices. Uh, and that discourse is the public discourse where Christians don't make sacrifice, but the reality behind that is money, right? huge amounts of money that are coming into Christian churches. And uh, I think it's that shift of not having not having the the fruits of the financial giving be the, the the center of the ritual that appeals to roman elites of the third fourth fifth centuries so an animal sacrifice that the animals donated they're, they're still donated by the wealthy elite uh those animals are like the core uh, but in the christian church uh the altar is empty and the only person you see is the the literate expert uh and the the discourse the anti-sacrificial discourse is, is prominent but then the reality behind the scenes is the place is covered with inscriptions, uh, donation inscriptions. It's that shift that I think appeals to, to Roman and everybody. Could, could, I, could I follow up really quickly? Um, mm -hmm. You know, when Augustine is talking about um, not actually burying near the saints, for example, or, or that prayers, prayers of the living are not necessarily helpful to the dead, the saints, yes, but not the living, he actually makes a suggestion that one should give alms, that one should actually donate alms. And so how much of this financial um, exchange are you thinking about that may not actually be to build the church, but could actually be to care for the poor. Is that possible also? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a critical piece of the, of the, the discourse and the reality that exactly people like Augustine are saying, come and give to the poor. Um, poverty doesn't get materially changed with the Christian empire in the fourth and fifth centuries. So uh, some of that money is surely going to the poor as uh, public giving had always benefited um, lower classes of Roman cities, Greek cities going all the way back. But a significant amount of that money is, is going to support the ecclesiastical elite that are running the churches. Uh, I think it's the same and probably, so uh, Arjun Siderhook in his great book about Roman giving calls the, calls the, the this giving icing on the cake. And I, I would suggest that it's probably the same thing within a Christian uh, the, the giving is not that much. It's not a huge percentage of the wealth of these elites, but it's it's a, a percentage that's critical for the way in which they present themselves as uh, people worthy of their elite status and their wealth, uh, and not you know the evil rich who got wealthy through uh, nefarious means. So we have another uh, question uh, for Dan uh, in the chat. Uh, this is uh, this is from Robin Walsh. Uh, and she says, Dan, you noted that to some degree, Christian attitudes and approaches 
to these practices were aspirational. Can you say a little bit more about the notion of Christianity as an aspirational movement in terms of status goals? Uh, thanks, Robin. Yeah, this is this absolutely uh, is part of your work too. So, uh, Robin, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows uh, Robin's uh, recent book on literate culture in, in early Christianity. Yeah, I think uh, so. What we're trying to explain is really a shift of a shift of a social network. Right? Why did a whole bunch of people who had given to Greek and Roman sources for their whole lives and saw themselves as worshippers of traditional Greco-Roman gods? Why did they suddenly want to be Christians? Uh, I think you need to look at the way in which uh, Christian practices appeal to who they want to be. And uh, especially a class of, uh, so economics are changing in the Roman empire, third, fourth century. And there's this huge class of uh, new men being produced often by the emperors, uh, new men who are not tied to the traditional Roman aristocracy. Uh, they're often tied to the military. And uh, I think we have really good evidence of the, the social pretensions of these, these new men. Uh, and many people have written on them this, the second sophistic and uh, this phenomenon. Uh, I think Christianity becomes part of that. It becomes a way to signal an identity that Romans want to signal, as opposed to uh, a traditional identity that becomes seen as uh, not the kind of person you want to be. I think we still have another question for Dan coming in. Um, and uh, so, uh, sorry, Nate, we're gonna <laughs> come back to you. But um, this one comes up to saying, this sort of following up, I think, would you not say that this works its way down to the less wealthy in the form of basic tithing? Uh, maybe that uh, kind of comes back to my question about alms as well. Uh, does, or does tithing get framed differently? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I'd have to have to think more about that. I think it definitely, the, the giving goes all the way down the social ladder in the same way that um, Greek and Roman Eurocratism went all the way down the social ladder to, you know, small scale elites in little tiny cities. Uh, you know, they're, they're not given very much because this is small, but that little giving is still really significant in that, uh, in that social setting. So uh, yeah, I think the scale goes all the way, all the way to the bottom uh, until you're at the poverty level, people who can't give anything. Uh, and then the Christian discourse sort of uh, lionizes them as the as the, the focus of the given. But the tithing point, um, yeah, Jennifer, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. I have to think about um, what our evidence for this for that is. I'm not, I'm, I'm not even sure it's, it's tithe, can someone help me in this one? Is, when does tithing actually become sort of part of Christian practice? I think almsgiving always, is something that bishops are pushing, but I'm not sure about tithing as such, maybe, I don't know. As an official requirement, yeah, I don't know. I think I see John has his hand up. John, go ahead. Thanks, Arthur. If I can cut the line and ask a, a verbal question, or really uh, of all three of our speakers, and thank you all, uh, listening to the combination of papers uh, made me focus again on what's going on or what we don't understand about what's going on in the third century particularly. It's the beginning of, if I understood everyone correctly, it's the beginning of the time, Dan, when a performing Christianity becomes a, a kind of an idea that some elite Romans want to adopt. Sarah, you nice, nicely talked about the ambivalences in the catacombs then and how we read the iconography. Is it pagan or Christian, or is that really just a matter of performance and that Christians are behaving like pagans in their offering practices and so on? And Nate, you know, the solar symbolism is right there, as you nicely show also in Christian and what we traditionally call pagan contexts. Uh, the question I'm really asking and any of you to comment on or think about, if it makes any sense, is to what extent, and this is not a new question, of course, that these terms, a uh, pagan Christian make any sense at all in the third century context when it's not even clear what it would mean to be a Christian or to be a pagan when the cultures and the customs, the iconographies are apparently blending. Um, are we barking up the wrong tree, myself included, when I sort of debate what the ethnic and religious affiliations are of people in the catacombs and suggest that there are uh, no way to tell but that they're all essentially just Romans, or is, is that itself a little bit too simplistic and that 
what it means to be joining that collective burial group, for example, or any of the other behaviors, the offering behaviors or the iconography behaviors, is uh, the development of a new way of expressing identity, which is itself a combination of behaviors and this new still nascent Christian idea, which doesn't, you know, post-Constantine, it's clear that why an elite uh, Roman would want to be performing Christianity, let's say, uh, for various reasons. But, but in that earlier period, when it's still at least politically as, as risky as it is beneficial, uh, what exactly did it mean? So I'll stop talking now. I'm really musing. I've, I've been stimulated by all the papers to those sort of uh, thoughts. And I wonder what you thought, any of you. Thank you. It requires process. I hope you don't think that that, that that's sort of like not a good question. You know, um, I, 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 I think I would, the, the first thing I thought of was actually the way you just ended this when you sort of flipped it as after Constantine, you can see why it would make sense to perform as a Christian. And it's sort of like, well, before Constantine, it certainly makes sense to perform as a non-Christian. And, and you know, that there just isn't really this, this broad symbolism that's accepted widely. I mean, I just, I always think about things like, you know, why the cross doesn't really take off, right? Because the, you know, they're still using them. And, and so of course that's not a symbol you're going to use. But you know, what I'm what I'm always interested in is just the the sort of idea that the third century seems to be a place where you just have so much complex dialogue going on. And that's actually something that Arthur can probably talk a lot about, you know, even more so as well. And to me, that's the sort of fun messiness of it, you know, where I think just to me personally, I, I just see it as, you know, strict ideologies are changing. Um, you know, if if there ever were any, they're changing. Um, and, and I think that that's what actually makes the period so interesting because of its messiness and because of its fluidity. And so I wouldn't necessarily say it's barking up the wrong tree, as you put it, because, of course, the dominant scholarship has tried so hard to differentiate the two and we're still in a process of trying to say not so fast and so i think that's why the question is still that you posed is just so valid so that's my that's my vain attempt to to get this conversation started how's that thank you <laughs> and if we go in order of speakers again i'll go next um yeah wow john that was such a great question i tried to write it all down i may be emailing <laughs> you in a few days um i love the idea of thinking about you know all of the funerary behaviors as you know performance performing family ties or you know and i know you and i have spoken about it i've asked you, you know why is there just one name is that a meaningful thing or is it just a broader societal shift at this time is it a christian thing or is it just a thing and um you know it's like my, what i was thinking about before this panel about how if you want to look at Christians reusing mythological sarcophagi, it becomes a Christian thing. But if you just look that everyone's doing it, then it's just the thing everyone's doing. And so yeah. is there a Christian meaning behind reusing this material or yeah. using it? Um, and I am just going to think about mm -hmm. your question. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully, uh, I think, you know, when we really look at the money, oh, which ties into, you know, Dan's talk, when we look at the money, the money being spent on things and the, the, the status of Christians at, in the early and third, early and middle of the third century, are we really looking at elite people who are buying sarcophagi? Mm -hmm. Or can we? I've had an argument with a friend about this who's like, absolutely not. There's not a single Christian who owned a sarcophagus before the fourth century, you know, before <laughs> 270, uh, you know, before the Santa Maria Antiqua sarcophagus. There was not a single person who owned a sarcophagus that was Christian. And I don't think that's the case. But I think you're just your idea about like, are they performing Christian or are they just performing death uh, is a really valid one. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sean. Uh, yeah, I think the question is exactly right. It shows that um, I, I would agree with everything Nate and Sarah just said. It shows that the the, the identity constructs that we're often uh, working with they haven't been built yet. They're really fluid. Uh, people are probably calling themselves 
probably not calling themselves Christians, but you know, yeah. if you ask them, like, do you worship Christ? They'd say, yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean that I don't do all yeah. these other things. Like, why would, why would that be different? Uh, and I guess the only thing I would add is that I think the, the evidence suggests that uh, a, a piece of piece of the presentation that the, the people we're in contact with as our spokespeople for Christian identity, they represent a tiny, tiny yeah. fraction. And they, they not only do they not speak for all people who might have self-identified as Christians, but even among uh, people who maybe adopted an exclusive Christian identity, they probably don't even speak for very many of those either. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that they really become a tiny little microcosm. But maybe it is the success, their success as a tiny microcosm presenting this very elite, educated, wealthy mm -hmm. uh, identity and linking that to Christianity. Maybe that's that gets us mm -hmm. towards the, the big question, which is why why Christianity is successful at all. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you all. Good answers. <laughs> I'm going to jump in and follow up with one more sort of point in that. I, I actually have sort of thinking about mythological scenes, but it's interesting because, of course, they return. So by the end of the fourth century, you've got something like the projector casket where you've got Venus and you also have Christ's name, you know, and Deo Cristo, I think it says something like that or something like that. Uh, anyway, a dedication, probably a gift from a very elite uh, wedding present to a bride, perhaps, um, but with a big Im image of Venus. And I'm thinking about the fact that, I mean, I look in my little neighborhood, we have statues of Venus next to statues of St. Francis. And, you know, and at Christmas time, we can see, you know, Snoopy appearing with the Magi, you know, and so it, it seems like people's identities are always kind of mixed up anyway. So I don't know if that's really, <laughs> I'm getting back to Dan's point of, well, what do people really know and, and, and how do they identify? And of course, on the other hand, if you ask them, at least in my little neighborhood, if they were Christians, they would insist they were, even though they have Snoopy uh, riding his airplane next to the Magi at Christmas time. But anyway, um, so it's just kind of, uh, I think we may be at the end. I see people are kind of fading away uh, gradually. So I want to just use my chance to say thank you to all of the presenters and all of the attendants. And please look into our website and, and think about joining if you're not a member. Um, think about applying for a grant if you're interested. And, um, you know, all of us have been, all, I think every one of the Catacomb Society, uh, I'm not sure, but I can speak for Pamela, who is also here, is the treasurer of the organization. Hi, Pamela. But uh, John Bodell, who's on the board, and Arthur, who is on the board and vice president, and I have all received grants from the Shohan uh, Foundation as well. And so we are all uh, much obliged to, the, to our founder and foundress, I guess we could say, and also to the society, and we're very excited about it. And so new things are happening. Please tune in on May 1st. Well, hi, Pamela. Thank you. Um, on May 1st, we're going to have another one of these um, presentations of three scholars. And of course, now I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Lily Wong, who was actually joining us for a while and had to drop out, is one of the speakers. Um, Arthur, do you want to remember the um, uh, I, I, Irina Gradante and- um, yeah, Elenia, Elenia uh, Gradante and, um, 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 mm, 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 mm. oh yeah, Lindsay Mazurek. Lindsay yeah. Mazurek, oh, oh, good. So please come back on May 1st um, and I'll have the poster has, should have the link. And if you have any problem getting uh, registered, please let me know just by email, emailing me at Notre Dame and I will be sure to help you get registered for that. So um, you can find me on the website if you uh, don't know your, don't know my email address. But anyway, um, I'm so grateful to all of the presenters and uh, wish you all a great rest of the weekend and on into spring. So thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for everything. I really appreciate all the work. Thank you. <laughs> all best. Hey, Arthur. All right. How how is how is the sleep going? Oh, you might want to stop the recording. <laughs> oh, yes, we should stop the recording. <laughs>